Hello and welcome everyone to Responding to Business Disruption, a webinar forming part of the virtual event series, Business as Usual, Reshaping the Present and Future, hosted by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, or WBCSD for short. My name is Austin Candy. I'm a Geneva-based manager within the Redefining Value team here at the WBCSD, and I'll be hosting this webinar, uh, mostly working in the background to curate questions coming from the audience and so on. We'll proceed to the interactive panel shortly, but first I'd like to quickly go over some logistics and briefly introduce you to the WBCSD. So firstly, this session is being recorded. Slides and recordings will be sent to the email address you use to register for this event within the next day or so. Throughout the session, please submit questions for our speakers through the Q&A function on the webinar control tab shown towards the bottom of the slide. I'll be flagging questions submitted by the audience to our moderator as we go through the event. Now for our mini introduction to the WBCSD. We are a global members-based organization of over 200 businesses leading in the sustainability arena, collectively representing business leadership for a sustainable future. Our members have a global footprint and represent a wide range of sectors. Uh, you can see a snapshot of our collective membership on the screen in front of you now and learn more on our website. Our work programs are member-led and focus on six system transformation themes alongside a handful of sector-specific projects, such as the Chemical Coordination Group, the Forest Solutions Group, the Tire Industry Project, and the Global Agribusiness Alliance. Each program is broken down into a range of projects focusing on more specific topics. And you can learn more, again, by visiting our website. Uh, but enough about us. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for today's event, Dr. Gail Whiteman. Gail is the professor in residence at the WBCSD and is actively involved in building science-based targets for collective business action. She's an expert in global risk and systemic change and the incoming professor of sustainability at Exeter University in the UK. Gail is a regular contributor to the World Economic Forum, serves on numerous advisory boards, and is the founder of the not-for-profit Arctic Base Camp a unique science solution outreach platform at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting at Davos. Over to you, Gail. Well, thanks, Austin, and uh, hello to my panelists, which are a great group of people, and hello to participants. Um, it's exciting to be able to do this webinar. It's our second uh, uh, version today with a different set of panelists. So I'm located in Europe. It's late afternoon here. Probably we've got some people that are dialing in from Pacific time. Uh, in the US, so probably early morning. Uh, thank you for getting up early. I hope you have a coffee. There may be some people dialing in also from Europe and the rest. Um, the topic, you know, it, it's such an interesting time and it's a tragic time, of course. Uh, the, the, the coronavirus pandemic is, uh, you know, I think the biggest disruption, uh, certainly in my lifetime, but perhaps in the entire century, um, or very close to the disruption we would have seen through uh, major events like the World War. So, so it is uh, incredibly topical that the World Business Council for Sustainable Development has decided to focus on this. And, and the approach we're taking is to not have set pieces. We want to have a conversation with this fantastic panel that we've got and also get some audience uh, questions from you. So stay tuned on that. And I hope that we, we um, uh, do a deep dive on some of the topics that, that really matter. Before I start, I'm going to give a very short um, sort of context setting piece by saying let's take a look at global risk and and, and of course you know I, I myself although I study global risk um, I, I was also caught off guard uh, with the coronavirus um, I didn't have uh, say a, a, a pandemic uh, playbook for my family or for the organizations that I work with but but realistically as much as most of the world including uh, us but but the world governments and, and many companies were caught off guard, but people did know that there was a, a risk of this sort of thing happening. If we take a look at the World Economic Forum's uh, annual global risk report, this was launched in January in Davos um, just before uh, uh, Europe started to close down, but certainly while well, Wuhan was already struggling uh, to deal with uh, coronavirus. We can see that in terms of long-term risk outlook, um, when we look at, at two categories of uh, respondents that uh, WEF talked to, in terms of their multi-stakeholder group, so 750 odd uh, experts around the world, um, the likelihood of uh, risk was strongly focused on environmental uh, factors, also data fraud, cyber attacks, water, 
global governance factors, and asset bubbles. So those were the risks that seemed quite likely. They're all very large and particularly part, part, uh, potentially very painful. But infectious diseases, so AKA the pandemic, was identified in the top 10 by this group of experts um, in terms of impact. It's clear that we're seeing that now. There's a massive impact um, both economically and uh, even more tragically in terms of human, human lives. Um, uh, so it's not something that was unknown. If we take a look at the global shapers, um, who are the younger uh, 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 movers and shakers that the WEF talks to, again, uh, they had a similar spread in terms of um, uh, what was the most likely of the long-term risks, slightly in a different order, although environment all at the top as well. Uh, in terms of impact, they actually saw it in, uh, as uh, infectious diseases as number nine. In addition to this, the scientific community, um, the medical science community um, had done a number of scenarios really looking at pandemics. The UK, where I am located, had done a, a, a scenario building exercise uh, extensively on a corona type uh, pandemic in 2016, um, as well as identifying what needed to be done to prepare if this actually did. Now, no surprise, the UK, of course, like many other governments, did not prepare <coughs> adequately. So it's not always that we don't have experts thinking it may happen, it's because the likelihood is, seems to be low and uh, eyes go on a different ball, often more short term. And quite frankly, I think there's a behavioral bias that the impossible doesn't seem possible until it's far too possible, which is where we, we are now. So I think that there's a lot that we can learn um, from Corona. So I'm delighted to be able to, 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 to have this session recorded and to be able to really pick the brains of the experts on the panel that I'll introduce in a second. But it's not just to really deal with the next pandemic, which we may have wave two. It's also to take a look at, at some of the other systemic risks that are coming down the, the, the road. I, I got this off um, Facebook. Um, it was a, a, a cartoon that was shared quite extensively. And uh, not to minimize um, the massive concern that we had and have on the impact of coronavirus. Uh, but, it, you know, there was a definite um, a, a strong unite behind the science to say, let's follow science and flatten that curve. We can't prevent it, but what we can do is not become as overwhelmed by it as some of the scenes we saw, of course, unfortunately, in Italy um, and, and elsewhere now, in, in New York especially, um, London as well, uh, in Spain. So my point is that what are the lessons that we have from COVID-19 to really help us identify uh, ways, to, what's the playbook for really um, flattening the curve on, on big scale issues that we know are coming from a scientific perspective in terms of climate change and also biodiversity loss. So this is about corona business disruption, disruption but I think our, all our minds are also about, so what, what is it for the future as well? So, so um, that's from, from uh, my perspective, uh, a little bit of the scene setting. I now like to uh, do a very brief antitrust statement reminder. We're a business organization here. We've got a lot of companies both on the panel uh, and on the line. And I'd like to remind everybody to avoid any discussion or conversation of competitively sensitive uh, topics such as pricing, costs, uh, uh, bid strategies, uh, future capacity additions, customers, or output decisions. So let's keep that in mind and not uh, 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 break the uh, antitrust uh, reminder here. Now turning over to our, our panel, which again um, is, a, is, is a very illustrious one, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do a very brief inter, inter, introduction and then uh, really let um, e each of the panelists talk uh, about some of our, our opening uh, uh, opening lessons. I'm delighted to have you, Bill, uh, uh, Bill Weil, uh, uh, call in from San Francisco. Thanks for getting up so early. Um, Bill is the founder and executive director of Climate Voice, which is a not-for-profit initiative to really make companies uh, stand up and, and go the, the extra mile on climate change. Um, he also has um, a, an amazing past experience and a very glamorous job title of Global Energy, Energy Czar at Google. He was head of sustainability at Facebook. He's on a number of boards. So delighted to have you uh, with us today, Bill. 
Uh, next panelist is Karina Lidvak. Uh, Karina is a fellow Canadian like me, so that's great to, uh, to have two of us on, on the line. Um, and she's a non-executive director for the Italian large energy company, NE. Um, she has worked extensively in financial services, is an expert on sustainable finance, and is the founder of Chapter Zero, has worked very closely with World Economic Forum in terms of building a movement around boards and, and, and moving that towards um, a, the low carbon, uh, uh, a zero emissions uh, future. Welcome, uh, Karina. Uh, next, we have uh, Marcello Fabroni. Uh, Marcello is director of Bueller's, Bueller's Innovation Center. Um, I'm, I'm excited to learn a lot more about Bueller. It was a company that I didn't have uh, brand recognition from, but basically is the company behind so many other food companies that really, uh, Marcello, you and your business are everywhere uh, in life as, as we know it today. So lots to talk about in terms of food and innovation. And uh, our last panelist, I'm delighted to see again, she was with us on our, our, our first webinar this morning, um, is Serpil Tashkileoni. And um, she is uh, in charge of uh, food and uh, innovation and transformation at Unilever. And uh, Serpil and I have known each other for some time, so delighted, delighted to have you back. Um, we will have some audience questions, so stay tuned. But how I wanted to kick off was to um, uh, ask each of the panelists in both a personal and a professional uh, perspective, what were your highs and lows from lockdown? So here's a chance to give us a little bit behind the scenes um, and start off on an informal tone. Uh, Bill, can I, can I start off with you? Sure, and I, I, I'm delighted we're going in alphabetical order by first name. I'm usually at the very far end of panels. Yeah, so. me too. So, <laughs> um, since I since I had to get up earlier than most of you, I think it's only fair. Um, uh, on the lows, I mean, I I even hesitate to, you know, I I am safe and healthy, and my family is safe and healthy, and so it's hard to even talk about the lows, you know, there are many small personal losses. We're sheltering in place. Um, there are lots of family events for the next few months that have been canceled. Um, uh, but, you know, my immediate community is fine. Um, and so I feel very lucky for that. The, the, the biggest low really is just the, looking at the, the lives that have been devastated both by the disease directly and by the economic disruption. It's just, it's really tragic and, and awful to see. On the plus side, um, seeing how communities have come together um, at many scales has really been heartwarming and gratifying and how determined people are to really help each other. Neighbors helping each other. We've been helping some of our neighbors, some of whom are immunocompromised. And, and they've been helping us with things. Um, uh, so people are really coming together and helping each other. And I think, uh, you know, for the first few weeks, uh, I think people were completely focused and distracted on and, and distracted by the pandemic. And now it seems like people are beginning to step back and think about the even bigger looming climate crisis, that, that cartoon you showed of the you know, we're flattening this curve, but there's a bigger curve we need to worry about, and science tells us it's coming. So I'm, I'm seeing people beginning to step up to that, and that's also, I think, a, a big plus. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bill. Um, Karina, can I ask you to tell me about your highs and lows? Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm going to start with the professional, which is that the high and the low are one and the same. Um, two of my boards um, are facing really existential threats, uh, you know, th this is really devastating. Um, but the high is that particularly in the case of the oil company, we had already, I mean, this is so ironic, but on the day that Italy went into lockdown is the day that we unveiled our, our um, carbon transition strategy to 2050. It was the first time that we'd actually done that. And instead of going on a physical roadshow to, um, to, you know, to, we had to do it on, on screen and, uh, and everybody went into lockdown. But, but the high is that we've announced that we're going to accelerate into the curve. You know, we're not going to let this um, dilute, dilute our commitment to really taking ourselves out of oil and into 100% clean, uh, clean energy products. So that to me is really um, exciting, obviously difficult to execute, but at least the direction of travel, we're pointing in the right direction, let's put it that way. On the personal side, 
I have three girls of my own. Uh, one's about to have our first grandchild. I don't know if I'll see that child. Um, the other is a doctor who works in a COVID ward and she's lost patients and it feels very weird. She lost a five-year-old. You might have seen this. She works in Manhattan. Uh, you know, it's devastating. And my other daughter works as a lawyer uh, serving um, undocumented uh, workers and you know basically representing their labor rights they're being fired they're being evicted and her favorite client died <laughs> of covid so it's also very rude and, and it's she's just suffering more even than the doctor and then i have three boys who are not mine who are who are all refugees from war zones and um and they, for them, this is just surreal. They don't understand why we're making such a fuss and why everybody's locked down. And I have to work really hard to persuade them to just do what they're told. <laughs> I mean, they're boys, they're young men, actually. I call them my boys, but you know, I feel like a witch not letting them go out, not letting them go to work, not letting them see their friends and you know, stay overnight. And for them, um, this is so trivial compared to what they've been through and it's just, hard to get that message across so well thank, thank you Karina that's um, uh, uh, already uh, I think uh, very much affecting for all of us listening and we it resonates with us uh, um, certainly in terms of what we've seen on the news but also how we deal with with our own kids so thank you for that it's very very authentic um, sharing um, Marcello could I ask you to share some of your personal and professional highs and lows Sure. Um, there are several lessons I, I take with me. So number one is for sure that um, crises teach you very hard that there is so much um, you cannot influence in this world. And um, this is pretty tough. But um, I would say on the positive side, we as a company, we set up a, a steering committee and uh, we set up clear rules um, for the whole company. And number one was for sure the health of our employers. Number two, um, we um, gave clear guidance also about um, safeguarding our liquidity because this is key during such a crisis. And number three, then also clear message to the organization that we have to serve our customers by using IT solutions. And this was um, really done in a good way. And another topic on from the low side, you know, we managed to have about 5,000 employees which worked at home and this was great you know basically you can um, also by that uh, re reducing cost but also and um, save co2 um, topics but on the other side there is um, time when a lot of um, people employees work at home that there is a, a massive attack also on your it systems and for that you need to be prepared and uh, another highlight, what I would say also within um, our organization was the solidarity. You know, we, we are within 140 countries uh, at Google. And, you know, it started basically in China, it went to Asia. And there was a huge solidarity within the builder group um, um, supporting everybody. We, we had um, daily calls with China, with US, with Europe in order to, to check how we can support each other. This was really well appreciated there was no how shall i say no borders so everybody was in the same room and we had this really nice solidarity within the company this was really cool great thank you thank you marcello uh circle can i ask you about highs and lows yes so uh, i've been working already uh, from home since march with my unilever colleagues uh, means also less travel and uh, more time spending with the family at home um, but also making a lot more online connections with all our colleagues across the globe. Uh, I'm quite inspired by the flexibility of our people eh, and how we swiftly can uh, switch from one channel to the other. As you've seen, uh, the restaurants have closed and all the people that were serving the restaurants have switched into retail channels to help us there. But also marketeers are becoming very uh, creatively to uh, adjust their plans. Also our R&D and supply chain colleagues that then uh, very quickly switch into virtual trials to help with the product development and, and launches. So in that respect, uh, uh, super to see that energy and, and adjusting to this situation. Uh, also on the, yeah, what you also see is that uh, because of it, yeah, um, we are also combining home uh, work with home teaching. I have a daughter of nine years old. 
and uh, in uh, in the Netherlands where I live, uh, the, uh, the the yeah, the 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 kids are now allowed uh, below twelve uh, years to go to school. So she started last uh, week, and uh, she concluded that her teachers were much better than us. Uh, so that was my love, but on the other hand, I really appreciated all the efforts of the teachers that are also pivoting to the situation and really helping, uh, helping out. So uh, also, Gail, to your end, uh, thank you very much on all you're doing to help uh, on teaching. Gosh, th thanks. Well, I'm sure that I'm sure your, your, the, the teacher your daughter has are, are much better than what we're doing online. I'm, I'm positive of that. Well, well, thanks, everybody. I'd let, now like to turn to a short poll with the audience to try and get some input uh, for the panelists on how you see um, uh, uh, Corona uh, affecting um, uh, your, your, your organization and, and how that's responding to it. So you will see on front of your screen um, uh, three questions. We start with the first and then we'll, we'll see what the poll says and then we'll move to the second and then the third. So if you can please let us know is, uh, and I think that is the third uh, question, Austin. I think we're starting with the third question. Could we start with the first one, please? Okay, yeah, that's great. We're back on. So the first question is, how disruptive has the pandemic response been to you professionally? Going from extreme, extremely uh, disruptive to not at all. And I'll just let uh, the audience have a few, few uh, 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 moments to, to answer that question. And Austin, if you can tell me when the uh, uh, votes are in. Sure, let's just give it a minute. About half the participants have voted so far. Okay. Okay, so I think we can see that, that nearly half um, have seen it as a, a very um, disruptive. Uh, another 7% um, see it as extremely and somewhat. Uh, there's a lucky 13% that haven't seen it as binarily disruptive, uh, but nobody has said that it's not at all disruptive, which I think is, is um, uh, quite un uh, as uh, we could predict. Now, the second question would be, how vulnerable do you feel your organization was or is to the crisis, the pandemic crisis. Again, it's same uh, sliding scale, extremely to not at all. How are we doing, Austin? Okay, so I think that we've got actually a, a, um, a, a more uh, spread picture, but it actually looks like that, that, that although many people felt that, that professionally it was very disruptive, um, they see it as only their organizations, uh, the majority more somewhat vulnerable. So it seems that although some are extremely vulnerable, 11% and some are very, what we can see is that there's also a, 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 a significant group of 47% that are seeing it as somewhat disruptive, but, but uh, not catas cataclysmic. And a lucky 5% only see uh, their organizations as um, a little vulnerable. And the final question we have for the audience is, how comprehensive do you feel that your organization's response has been to the business disruption that we have uh, seen and are currently living through? Going again from extremely to not at all comprehensive. Okay, so we, well, some amazing uh, responses here. 18% feel that their um, organizations have responded comprehensively. That is a very large group, larger than what we saw this morning. Uh, and another 53% think that their, the com their companies or organizations have responded very comprehensively. Somewhat and only a little, a 6%. Uh, so it definitely seems that many of the, the audience members on this call have, uh, have done well in terms of how they've responded to, to what seemed like an impossibility three to four months ago. Okay, thank you audience. Now we are gonna go to the first question. I have five questions uh, for the panelists uh, and we'll intersperse a, a couple from the audience as we have time. Um, if we could get rid of the 
pull from the screen. I think I can do that. Great. I'm going to start with the, the micro, and I want to ask each of the panelists to briefly sort of expand a little bit from probably some of your professional uh, comments on lessons from lockdown uh, on highs and lows. But we've clearly seen um, that this uh, pandemic has created a new way of working. Um, we are doing this session as a webinar. We are all Zoom masters now, uh, and we might not have been a little while ago. Um, how do you see the, 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 the new ways of working for companies? And as well as how do companies um, need to deal with, uh, as we move back into the new normal, um, this idea of employee safety, um, mental health issues, uh, how, do we, how do we do that? So if I could kick off with you, Marcello, and uh, it, you could maybe get, share some examples from, from Bueller. How is the new normal uh, going to affect your ways of working? Yeah, thanks for this question. Basically, as I mentioned before, we had about 5,000 employees working um, from home. And for us, it was really essential that we, we said also, or we gave clear um, guidings and helpings how, how to, to deal with this new environment. And basically, we clearly said, um, or we gave five topics. That means usually, if you work at home, you should start the, the day as usual. So wake up in the morning, get out of the pyjama, you know, because otherwise you do not get into this normal working mood. Then that basically you should also set up a suitable place. Um, once you, you work at home and not then just work on the sofa, you know, this would not be really helpful. Then also number three would be plan the day, um, um, really do daily schedules with breaks, make sure that you get up. Because usually if you work at home, you know, um, at least um, I had this issue, you sit down at seven in the morning and you get up at eight in the evening without having breaks. So please make sure that you have clear schedules and all the breaks. Then avoid distractions, you know, if you have kids at home, try to, to find a place, as I mentioned before, um, where is quite um, space. And I guess one of the most important topic is really um, stay in contact with your people, make sure that you have also um, digital coffees, that you, you get involved. And this is basically um, what we handed out to our employers. Now, um, now the employers are coming back. And um, what we see now, um, we make sure that people feel safe, you know. So we make sure that um, cleanless. We, we clean all the door handles. We make sure that we have disinfection on hands everywhere. Um, we, make, we make sure that we have also more open space um, within, uh, within the offices. We make sure people coming in, um, if, you have, if they grab um, food, if they grab drinks, that it's really just take away food, take away drinks. And from that point of view, we re really make sure that people feel safe if they come in. And that's, I guess, key lesson number one, yeah. Great, great. Well, thank you, Marcello. I'm wondering, Bill, if I could ask you uh, to respond a little bit to the idea about this whole online world that so many of us have now um, become completely subsumed by. You have a lot of experience uh, in, your, in your past uh, uh, executive roles. Is it here to stay? Um, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Have we, have we made a massive transformation or is it uh, go, going back to the, 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 the old way of, 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 of working? Will we be flying around the world going to meetings or has some of that changed? I think some has changed. It will be interesting to see. I don't think we'll keep going just like this. I mean, many of us have the privilege to be able to work from home. Many people have not. You know, the, the people who used to be a little more invisible and we didn't think about who are really essential workers have been actually enabling all of us to do what we're doing. Um, uh, but those of us who can work from home, I think uh, we now have the technology that we didn't really have 15 or 20 or 30 years ago to do this and have it be pretty good. It's still not, it's not the same as being there, you know, being in a place for a conference or for a business meeting in a company where you're bouncing ideas off each other and you're having the hallway conversations and then you're sharing a beer or a meal afterwards. I think that we don't get that in, in this kind of interaction. So, but I think we will see a lot more of this. People are seeing, I mean, I've been, I've been working from home you know, not from an office for the last two, almost two and a half years. And, but I've been going out and meeting with people in person a fair amount. And I miss that. And it's a different kind of interaction. Um, 
Uh, so I, I think some of this will stay. I mean, the, the not having to commute, it's great when you can avoid it. Um, and, uh, and not having to fly somewhere to do an event, um, especially if it's going to be a one hour event or something, hugely better to do that than, than to go somewhere. So, so yeah, I think, I think it's here to say uh, it will not be as extreme as what we're doing now. Yeah, I, I agree. Karina, maybe, thank you, Bill. Karina, could you maybe um, expand from your perspective, uh, sort of looking at finance, but also from an energy perspective? How have the trends that we've seen with response, business response to Corona, how, how many of those are here to stay and, and, and what's that looking like from, from your viewpoint? All right, let me just preface by saying that I'm, I'm not speaking for my company. I don't have the authority to do that and these are very much personal views. Um, so, you know, um, unquestionably what Bill just said, there, some of those changes are going to stick not 100% for all the reasons he said, but they will, uh, a big proportion of them, uh, particularly those, you know, hopping on a plane for a one or two hour meeting when you already know the people very well and you don't need that hallway conversation or that drink or dinner afterwards to keep, you know, sort of oiling the wheels of the relationship, that's going to go without a doubt and that's going to cut into demand. And so, you know, I do wonder when people in the industry uh, talk about reversion to uh, normality and they put a date on it, I simply don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but you'll, you'll have seen in the news for sure that, you know, the CEO of BP is now, you know, yeah. hypothesizing that that peak may have come. And I think there's a real legitimacy to that view. You know, I mean, we in our company, I can say this because we said so publicly, we announced that our oil production was going to peak in five years and our gas production in 10 you know, the question in my mind now is, are we going to bring those dates forward? Um, because, because the market is moving. Now, we were ahead of the market in terms of all the predictions. So we were, we were going to reduce our production ahead of where we saw demand going in anticipation of other trends that we felt we wanted to capitalize on. But it now looks like the market will move faster even than we thought, at least in my personal view. And we need to, we need to get in front of that freight train, not or rather you know, on that freight train, not to get smashed by it. So, so aviation in particular, I think, which, you know, is a small proportion of demand, but the fastest growing, that is really under pressure. Um, you might've seen that Air France was only able to access bailout from funds in exchange for a commitment to discontinue any internal routes that are um, available by rail. France has a fantastic rail network, so that's a lot of domestic routes that have just gone. Now, it's going to be harder for my friends who serve on Canadian um, airline boards to do that, you know, um, try getting on a train from Montreal to Calgary. But, um, but nevertheless, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, hard uh, thinking about what we do with aviation, and that's going to flow through to the energy companies without question. I agree. Incredibly uh, interesting time right now for aviation and, and others. Th thank you, Karina. Uh, Serpil, maybe I could ask you to comment about the sort of new normal and also bring up some of the, you know, the challenges facing the food system and uh, many people who are out of work. Yes, yeah, so thanks, Gail. I think uh, maybe first around ways of working. Um, we see definitely a lot of digital engagements, as Machilo just alluded to. But what I think is the upside to it is that, for example, we have been having a lot of town halls with our leadership team, but also like doing uh, normally visits to our countries where we got to learn what's happening in the countries. And now we can include more people to join those discussions because it's all virtual. So in a way, there are some upsides to the virtual ways of working too. And what is, I think, quite from a mental well-being uh, nice to see is that uh, our people are getting creative. So they're organizing also a lot of social connects. So we had to even online uh, cooking classes, yoga, so virtual uh, pop quiz, so people are finding ways to make these virtual connects. I think in the going future, people will consider, okay, well, what really is business critical for my travel and what can I do more online? So I think there will be a more conscious choice how we work uh, going forward. On the uh, business side, what we are seeing uh, obviously uh, with food uh, is that uh, yeah, a lot of the demand that we have seen from uh, out-of-home channels 
uh, that all shifted into in-home because of uh, restaurants closing, workplaces closing, uh, that uh, people are staying at home. That also means that you're cooking more at home. Uh, so we see a lot of demand, increased demand for uh, nutritious and affordable products and also uh, plant-based products that are becoming mainstream. In terms of food systems, I think a, a great challenge ahead because it's already on a critical pressure as you, as you can imagine like the bigger wider picture around the ability for us all to feed 9 billion people in 2050. Uh, yeah, it's not going to happen unless we change the system and, and with all the changes which is happening currently putting food, food systems even more under pressure. I mean, today, for example, uh, more than 800 million people are uh, going uh, bad to, hungry to bed, uh, while on the other hand, 2 billion people are obese, and while on the other hand, we are throwing away one third of the food throughout the value chain. And if you see what's happening currently with uh, more than 20 million people in the US uh, getting out of jobs, as well as in India, more than 100 million people, and we see a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, food being thrown away, like in UK, all the milk that is being thrown away, is raising the question around what's going to happen and how can we fix the food system, which is now becoming urgent now. So uh, from that point, we see that uh, consumers uh, are uh, asking uh, this, but also for an opportunity for us as an industry to step up around food waste, why is milk being poured away, where there, there is a huge food bank lines, uh, food accessibility, it, uh, we are entering on, into major recession, so how can I afford food for my family, on nutrition and looking for healthier diets for immunity, and on the other hand, uh, sustainability remains a concern, so I believe this brings a lot of uh, fertile ground also for, uh, for innovation, both on the short and the long term. I'm still muted, sorry about, thank you, Serpal, for that. Um, I, I, so we've got the, the sort of the new ways of working and the new normal, and, and it, let's move now to the board view. Um, uh, so I'd like to turn over to Karina, and then Bill, I might ask you to add a few comments after that, but, but you know, this is a massive uh, global crisis. Um, what's your perspective on boards? Were they ready for this? Um, or what are the lessons learned uh, uh, for the boardroom? If you could share some with us, it would be great. All right, well, I, given that I serve on three, I can make comments without attributing. <laughs> and what was so interesting to me, and also I have friends who serve on boards, and I've been, you know, we've been, you know, actively comparing notes. And, you know, I have one board that was literally sending us weekly updates. Uh, um, and, um, you know, it wasn't that they were necessarily wasting tons of time producing in, in materials strictly for us. They were simply resending to us what the management SWAT team was circulating, but it kept us on top of it. And they were holding weekly meetings with a subset of the board to get input. I mean, the board was very much on top of it. And if not, I mean, not driving it, but, but keeping very close to management. And I think that's the way things should be. And at the other end of the spectrum, um, when, you know, weeks went by without an emergency meeting being called or anything i not weeks but several i mean certainly a couple of weeks um i said look you know i'm sure you guys are doing a fabulous job i know you're all on it but could you could you just please keep us posted um and there was a sort of an irritated we've got this one and that those are the two you know the two ends of the spectrum and i have a friend who serves on a board where the latter is what she experienced um you know, I think when it, when something is this bad, it's a real test um, of whether the board is regarded as uh, integral to decision making or actually just something that you put there to satisfy investors and regulators and so forth about, you know, we've got a board. So, um, you know, read that, read into that what you will, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. Oh, great. I thank you very much for that sort of inside perspective. Bill, did you want to uh, add in on, on the, the board question? Yeah, I mean, I can speak generally. I'm on the board of a couple of small companies, and I think they've responded amazingly well to this. But this, this is a crisis that I, I don't think anyone was ready for, right? I mean, clearly, not almost none of us were really ready. But the, the scale of the disruption has been extraordinary economically and otherwise. And, 
Um, I, I think that some companies and, and the ones I'm involved in certainly, um, they paid attention to the science and they looked at the leading indicators and they didn't pick a scenario. They looked at the range of, a range of scenarios. And I think that particularly when there's so much uncertainty, that is the way you have to approach things. And um, I would say I've been fortunate the boards I'm involved in, the, the management has kept us really in touch with what's happening. Um, I think for, for management to get irritated at the board for wanting to be involved in something like this is, you know, the, the potential scale of disruption to the business is so large that the board has to be at least informed and able to step in and, and provide advice and, and honestly real guidance at times. So, um, but I, I'm sure there, you know, I, I have friends on other boards and I, there definitely has been a range. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'd like to take an, an audience question now. Austin, could you send me one audience question if we have one? Austin, are you on the call? Yep. Um, so remember for the audience participants that you can continue to send in Q&A questions um, through the app. So there's a Q&A button on the toolbar. I think one that would be really interesting is to think a little bit more about, you know, how large multinational enterprises are adjusting to and planning around kind of national and regional differences and restrictions and the severity of impacts. So it's one thing to talk about sort of employee health and safety as if companies are a monolith. It's another thing to recognize that a lot of our members have global footprints and how are they kind of dealing um, with some of these differences. Great, so if any of the panelists want to jump on that, not everybody has to, but if you've got a global view in terms of regional uh, uh, differences during lockdown and, and during recovery would, would be great. Yes, this is Karina and I do. In fact, I have a strong view on this, if I may. <laughs> please, please, um, that makes it more exciting. <laughs> because, you know, uh, let's be really blunt. Um, the quality of response uh, across the world has been extremely variable. Some countries have governments that have been exemplary um, and, and some have not. And when you operate in many, many jurisdictions, one thing I personally think is not good enough is to say um, we're protecting our employees and we are going with local guidance because sometimes local guidance is simply not acceptable. And so my view has been, and in the boardroom it has been to say, when local guidance is objectively not good enough, because you know what's being done in, in the countries that are well run, please can we ensure that we protect our employees to the same standard. So let's not say you have the option of working from home. Let's say you are instructed to work from home unless your job is to deliver diesel fuel to hospitals. In that case, get behind the wheel as fast as you can and we'll give you all the protective gear you need. But I really feel very strongly that we have to go for the highest common denominator and where we possibly can to be a voice for responsible action. And here in the UK, for example, when the government dithered for weeks on this, you started to see one by one companies not only um, unilaterally shutting their doors, sending their employees home, et cetera, but then quietly working behind the scenes to talk to the, minister, the prime minister, talk to their MP, talk to their trade association. And it is because of pressure from below that the government finally did a U-turn on policy. It's because companies, institutions, colleges, et cetera, said this is unsustainable we are putting our staff our students our customers at risk so i think there's really an important role here for companies to look to take a, um, a best practice view and to go beyond protecting their employees and to protect the community so it's not about saying we're keeping our employees safe that goes without saying as far as i'm concerned but also to reduce the speed of contagion by saying we're not going to have customers come into our coffee shops much as we would love to sell coffee to them because that accelerates the speed of contagion. Sorry guys, no coffee for the next few weeks. You know, that's how it should be. Oh, well, thank, thank you for that frank insight. Uh, a, a panelists, anybody else want to jump in on the, the, the global, the global uh, 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 different regional differences? Yeah, Gail, maybe uh, I can uh, give a comment uh, because what we're seeing is that uh, 
countries are shutting down also their borders for uh, movement of goods, which is obviously uh, giving us problems around uh, food products being, being stockpiled. We believe that, uh, that resilient food systems have to be having more open and international uh, movements uh, to ensure that we can uh, ex yeah, provide access to foods for all, but also very important for the future in terms of food security. Because if uh, export controls continue to exist, it leads to stockpiling, which then will lead into food price inflation and we will in, uh, yeah, encounter kind of a vicious circle. So in that uh, sense, uh, also from global uh, companies and through working uh, with platforms like World Economic Forum and WBCSD, it helps us to uh, work with uh, also both governments and NGOs to, to help that access uh, to, to, to food uh, across the world, especially in the developing countries where the need is the highest. Great, great. Th thanks, for, thanks for that, Serpil. Um, I would like now to move into uh, another question that I have. So thank you, audience member, for a very good one. Um, and I'd really like to talk to Martello and then Serpil about innovation. And so how does the innovation functions um, or structures of an organization both help it respond or prevent or, or somehow build resilience in things like uh, coronavirus times, but also what is, it, has there been an impact on the innovation function towards the low carbon economy because of the pressures of coronavirus, perhaps those being economic? So Martella, maybe you should give us a little bit of an insight here on, on how Bueller Innovation Center is um, uh, responding and, and, and buffering and building resilience. Yeah. Again, thanks for this question. Just to give you a little um, or short introduction, Biller is a family-owned company which is now um, over 160 years old and we are about um, 140 countries. And if it comes to sustainability, um, we set ourselves clear target. We set that we would like to reduce um, um, energy by 50%, waste by 50%, and water by 50%. And this is needed, as also Serpil mentioned that already, that by 2050 we will have to feed and move about 10 billion people. And everything we do, also within the COVID-19 um, um, topic now, all needs to be related to these new targets we set ourselves in order to be sustainable also for the future. So this is um, the main message. And Number two is, if, if you look also into the future and um, in this increased complex world, in the so-called VUCA world, um, for us it's clear that we, we need to collaborate. You know, we always say that 99.9999% of um, the global intellectual potential is outside of Bülow. And this is why we need to collaborate, we need to set up partnership. And this is exactly what we do and what we also um, do during the COVID crisis. Um, so basically, we talk to academias, we maintain the contacts to the partners. We, we still um, are looking for startups, um, which are exactly working this direction of the 50% target. So these are all topics that we will push and, and try to enhance also during this um, critical phase, yeah. Great, great. Thank you on that. So Serpil, tell me about how the work that you're doing, which I think is incredibly relevant right now um, in terms of the food transformation, how, how is that being impacted by, by COVID? Yeah, the food transformation, it, it has to accelerate also in this context, given the challenges that we will face, um, particularly food security becoming a, a real risk to the society. So uh, really finding these partnerships uh, with, uh, with other companies, NGOs and governments uh, will be critical to find the solutions that we need, whether it's on uh, food waste or food accessibility or on, uh, on nutrition, uh, to ensure that we find those solutions that uh, through the systems we can, uh, we can uh, change. As you know, food system is quite uh, uh, complex. It's interrelated and interdependent. Uh, from each other and, and in a way it represents a network of networks so this is why the collaboration is essential to find those solutions to, to solve the food systems. So we are super uh, glad that we are working on the platforms of uh, World Economic Forum and WBCSD to really, uh, to really find those um, uh, solutions uh, together. And do you think that the, the, the pandemic will help accelerate that? Uh, is there, are there indications that it will, will it actually help accelerate? 
Yeah, well, if you then look at the numbers eh, for now uh, that we see in the US where people, uh, uh, more than 20 million people are getting out of jobs and in, in India, uh, more than 100 million uh, people. While on the other hand, there are some uh, statistics, for example, from Bangladesh, where the household income of the people are reducing by 70% and that 50% of them are reducing currently their food consumption uh, means uh, uh, that, that, and on the other hand, uh, with all the experts, uh, export bans uh, uh, currently happening, uh, that the, 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 the food prices uh, potentially can go up means a big uh, issue around food security, food access. So uh, in that uh, sense, we need to find solutions providing um, uh, the food access, but also finding affordable products and creating uh, nutritious products to help uh, the, yeah, to feed the, feed the, the, the countries. Thank you. Bill, I'd like to now ask you to comment and, and expand on the idea of uh, stakeholder relationships in the time of Corona. Uh, obviously, um, you, you've got a vast experience in terms of the tech industry and sustainability, but with, you know, Climate Voice, you're also really asking companies to stand up and deal with the next big uh, curve that we need to flatten. So how are you managing stakeholder um, relations and expectations and trying to do that in a way that doesn't minimize the threats, of course, for, for, for health and safety that are happening right now? Yeah, well, I think that clearly dealing with the immediate is the first priority. We need to keep people safe and we need to keep people fed and housed. And, and there are lots of people where that's, that's still not true. Um, uh, but, you know, I think that, that especially large companies that are, um, that have massive cash reserves and that are still, you know, their business is still doing well or reasonably well in the face of this current crisis, or some actually are really thriving, um, uh, you know, they can walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, they can deal with the immediate crisis, but also with the, the, longer term, though actually quite present crisis. I mean, I live in California the last several years, we've had wildfires like we haven't seen in a very long time and climate change is making those worse. Australia saw massive, horrific wildfires this past uh, fire season. So climate's not a remote distant threat. I mean, it, it's here now and it will just get worse. Um, I think that, you know, the word stakeholder is really important. Uh, we've heard a lot the last few years from various quarters in business about stakeholder value versus just a narrow focus on shareholder value. And I think that we've seen some companies beginning to step up in a very positive way around the COVID-19 crisis to address the needs of a broad range of stakeholders. We have seen some that seem to be more, much more focused on their own narrow self-interest and not even maybe the, the health and safety of their employees, but if they're worried about their employees, they're not worried about the larger community. And I, you know, I think that, that the same is happening with climate. What we're trying to do with, with, with Climate Voice is get people to understand the role that companies play, not just in their own operations, but in the broader society around climate and the extent to which we need public policy, not just individual action by companies and employees and, and, and individuals, but public policy that steers the whole market in the right direction. And the role that companies play in, in uh, guiding and creating and shaping that public policy. Most companies today are on the sidelines when it comes to the public policy debates. And that's a problem because it allows those who want to preserve the status quo um, uh, to win most of those policy battles. So we are activating a large number of stakeholders, especially the workforce, employees and students as the future workforce, um, to really put pressure on companies to stand up across the board in everything they do on climate, not just in their own operations, but much more broadly. And I, I think this, this current crisis has kind of thrown things into very stark relief where we're seeing uh, how people are reacting to companies that focus on their own narrow self-interest versus the broader common interest. Great, thank you. 
Karina, I'm wondering if I can pick that up with you and, and if there's going to be, there's this opportunity to make such stakeholder issues more relevant to companies. Do you think boards are ready to hear it uh, in a stronger way? Um, uh, or what do we need to do to get stakeholder engagement um, in terms of global risks and the future of humanity farther up the board agenda and so that they will take courageous decisions, which many of them had to do uh, during this crisis? Yeah, excellent question. Um, difficult to answer in a single way because there's such variation from country to country, let alone from company to company. But the first thing to note is that the very idea of boards having direct contact with critical stakeholders is um, well established in the United Kingdom. It's starting to spread in, it has already started to spread in places like the Netherlands and I mean a few, but, um, but it's anathema in many, many uh, countries, including Italy, where I serve, it's unthinkable. Um, and it's unthinkable uh, in the minds of directors, in the minds of management who do not want their directors um, interacting directly with, um, with stakeholders, investors, and other stakeholders. And um, interestingly, the institutional investor community in Italy is very opposed. And it has to do with a history of not always appropriate behaviors, inside, inside dealing and, you know, so people sort of think the safest way, the easiest way to stay out of trouble and avoid market abuse is not to have any contact. And I come from a tradition, I mean, I did my whole investment career in the United Kingdom where for 25 years, it has been the norm for directors um, to meet with investors regularly. Not every director, but it'll be the, certainly the non-exec chairman, but it'll be the chairman of the remuneration committee, the chairman of the, sometimes the audit committee, the chairman of the remuneration of the um, sustainability committee, if there is one. Um, so it's much more fluid access. And I've been advocating this in Italy ever since I joined the board. And, uh, and I think it's gonna change. And I think it's gonna change because I've made the point and it's been echoed by people who matter that, <laughs> that um, we've, we've now burst into uh, a period where we're going to have to make such radical changes that we can only do it if we bring our investors with us. So we have to have uh, very open contact with our investors because, because we need to make sure that we are moving, we wanna, uh, we're at the stage where we wanna move faster than our investors in some cases, and we need to keep them with us. I mean, investors are very fragmented. You have those that are pushing companies to go net zero yesterday, and you have those who are saying, I invested in you to get dividends. If I want to invest in Tesla or, you know, a clean energy company or some non-polluting company, thank you. Just do a share buyback or I'll sell my shares and I will go invest there. I don't need you to change who you are. But if you're running a company, you're in it for, usually you, you want to be in it for the long haul and you want to change because the market is changing and you need your investors with you. So we're, we're entering a period of massive transformation where that level of dialogue and engagement is crucial if we're going to be successful in steering our way through it. Great. Thank you. Bill, did you have your hand up? Did you yeah, if I could just, just add to that, I think that that um, it's great to see, I mean, this, the boards I'm on, investors are part of the board, and because these are small startups, they're not yet public. Um, uh, but I think that, that in addition to investors, I think it's important for companies and probably the boards to engage with other stakeholders, right? So, the community leaders and employee leaders of the employee base and so on, um, because investors have a view. And as you said, there, there's a range of views among the investor community, but I think we're, we're seeing with this crisis, and I think this will be even more important with the climate crisis, that the range of stakeholders you need to, to engage with and understand their concerns, not assume you know what they're thinking and what they care about, but actually understand where they're coming from. You can't respond to it if you don't understand it. And I think if the board can't, can't, you need to understand where the investors are, you need to understand where other uh, stakeholders are as well. Great, thank you, thank you, Bill. So this, this leads me now to this idea of, you know, in the corona uh, uh, world, we um, have certainly um, gone through a lot um, since uh, uh, Asia uh, started this in December. Um, uh, we've been in lockdown in the UK and Europe, you know, sort of two, two and a half months. Um, if you're in Hong Kong, it's 150 days, I think. 
Um, so it, we, we, we've done a lot. And I'm wondering if we take a look at this idea of how are we coming out of Corona? There may be a second wave. But from your perspective, what does success look like as we um, leave the first phase of Corona? Um, there may be a second phase and hopefully try to enter into a low carbon uh, transition transformation, given the fact that the world is in a global recession, perhaps uh, of the scale that we haven't seen for a long, long time. So what does success look like for you, Marcello, coming from the food sector? Yeah, success uh, would mean, you know, if you could um, differentiate, it means if you could use this time now during the COVID phase, to really differentiate against your competitor. And for us, differentiation means, as I mentioned before, if you reach this 50% of waste reduction, energy reduction um, within our value chain, this will be a huge, huge um, differentiator. And this will help us really to come out of this COVID um, um, crisis in a, in, a, in a strong way. Uh, in addition to that, um, IoT, um, it's for sure also um, crucial. We, we need to, to leverage now our IoT solutions, which uh, we de developed, not just uh, within the COVID phase, but then also um, um, a little bit more within the COVID phase and really leverage all these topics going also in a sustainable value chain, also food safety will be crucial. And if we, if we can use these IoT solutions to move towards the targets, this would be really um, nice. Yeah. And then we will come out as, as winners. Yeah. And, and are you hopeful that we're doing that, Marcello? Yes, we are definitely, yes. We, we go the extra miles, um, at Bill, you know, just um, to give you a, a short example, Interpark, which is basically a, a big, um, big uh, exhibition, was cancelled um, and was postponed to 2021. And we just said, um, okay, postponed, but we would like to go the extra mile. And we made um, a virtual event where we had about 16,000 people in, you know, instead of going at the exhibition, we had 60,000 people in um, last Tuesday, Wednesday. We had over 450 um, virtual meetings with customers, and this was really highly appreciated. And so I believe that also with these IoT solutions, we are ready and we can also support our customers um, within the food value chain, but also in the mobility value chain. Thank you. Bill, if I can ask you, what does success look like as we leave this stage of the pandemic? I think one of the things, just to be clear, there might be a second wave. There might be a number of waves. We don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. We can hope that there won't be a huge second wave. Um, but this, the, where, where we go from here could last a long time. Um, and we can hope that we'll navigate that in a way that's that we begin to open up and the economy opens up up some uh, without having wild swings up and down. Um, uh, I think that one of the things that that is clear to make that happen and then again moving beyond that to climate is we need a stronger public sector and we need businesses willing to engage with the public sector, um, not fight them, um, but willing to actually work together and I think companies need to be part of making that happen, of strengthening the public sector so we can respond to, in a reasonable way, crises like COVID-19, but also like climate. It's vital for companies to do the kind of thing that Marcello was talking about in terms of cutting their own emissions, but that's not enough to get us where we need to be. You know, we talk about net zero by 2050, the IPCC says we need to cut emissions in half by 2030. And it's one thing to, to talk about that 2050 target, but we really also need to look at what do we have to do to get to 50% cut by 2030? That's 10 years from now. And that's not going to be just a bunch more companies saying, we're going to cut emissions in half or to net zero themselves. Society needs to get to a 50% cut. And that's going to require massive transformation, which requires market rules, it requires regulation. And as long as businesses fight regulation, whenever it's, it's, it's being proposed, um, it's not gonna happen fast enough. So businesses need to get on board with the idea that actually there is an important role for the public sector. 
and those that continue to sit on the sidelines, I think, will, will not be viewed well in three or five or 10 years. So, so to me, success is business working with the public sector, strengthening the public sector, and focusing on the goal, which for climate is cut emissions in half by 2030. Great, thank you. I, full, I fully, fully support that. Serpil, what does success look like from your perspective? Yeah, I think uh, strong international cooperation as well as building resilience now at all levels. I think uh, uh, with, uh, although an emergency crisis situation, uh, it provides also an opportunity to find solutions to the big problems that we are currently facing, whether finding the facts in or innovative solutions or uh, really finding the solutions around food systems. So in that respect, what actions can we put in place on our existing systems that can create a more inclusive nutrition and sustainable uh, future? And, and for me, the su success is then we find those solutions, uh, which I believe is the greatest leadership to challenge of our time. And Karina, thank you, Sir Paul. Karina, what, yeah, what does success I'll, look like to you? I'll answer your question, but I, I wanted to react to, to Bill for just a second, because yes, I think his, his comments are, are um, absolutely correct in a U.S. context, and they're shaped very much by the U.S. political culture and business culture in respect of, you know, opposing, uh, opposing government, opposing any kind of state involvement in the economy and so forth. But that is the United States. That is not the world. And um, the attitude in other parts of the world is very different. And in particular in Western Europe and increasingly Eastern Europe, um, that is not a debate. It's just a matter of execution. And so we're having arguments about the how and the who pays and the, you know, how do we protect uh, Polish coal workers and all of that. But nobody debates the fact that there is going to be, need to be, um, very strong government um, involvement in affecting this transition. And for example, the European Union is actively discussing how to bring emissions down by 50% uh, by 2030. And it's a question of the how, not the weather. So um, I think, you know, it's, it's really, it's absolutely critical in the United States for things to change, but, um, but the rest of the world is, is also has got different sets of challenges. And obviously if we move to India, there are different challenges, uh, Africa, several different countries with different sets of challenges. But I'd like to just, um, I would say that success in the areas where I'm working today um, consists of, first of all, um, accepting that just as Marcello just described, um, energy consumption is going to come down and that's a good thing. And if you're in the business of supplying energy, you accept that and you look elsewhere for, um, for value generation. And the value generation comes from enabling people who cut down trees to survive to um, generate clean energy in order to, to, to flourish. And so the, the business proposition for companies in the, in the energy industry, particularly those that have a global footprint, um, is, is to... Um, is to bring the innovation that they've developed in their home markets, if they happen to be European or, or North American or wherever, and, and adapt them to you know, countries in Africa in particular, but also Asia, also parts of Latin America, where there is so much to be gained by converting you know, agricultural waste into um, clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's just one of many examples. We haven't talked about the circular economy, which is, of course, a huge area of focus for uh, WBCSD, and you alluded to it in the introductory remarks, but that is, a cr I mean, that's the other side of the coin in fighting climate change. Um, there are so many opportunities to slash emissions by, um, by you know, harvesting opportunities in the, in the circular economy state, um, in the circular economy uh, market. And certainly in the case of energy, there are so many opportunities. Great, great. Thank you, Karina. Well, I think those have been an excellent set of uh, conversational uh, starters. Uh, what I'd like to do as we move towards our closing comments is not just ask people to summarize what's their favorite point or their last key point, but we're really seeing this as a, a working session for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And uh, what in your closing comments, what are your closing thoughts? What's your message in a bottle to Peter Bacher, the CEO of WBCSD? 
Um, what should he and WBCSD do to leverage their 200 plus uh, uh, member companies and to, to help us uh, transform, not just uh, uh, to become more resilient to pandemics, but towards a low carbon e economy. So what's the message in the bottle to Peter? And we'll certainly be sending, sending these to him. Serpil, if, if you wouldn't mind, if I could start with you, that would, that would be great. Yes, uh, sure, Gail. I think you can remember that we were in India a few years ago at the WBCST Leadership Program and Peter came to speak to us and he shared uh, with us have the courage because one person can change the company. And I want to give this message back to him. He has 200 member companies with WBCST. I think he can change the world. So I have the courage to do so. Love it. Love it. Marcello, what's your message in a bottle to WBCST? Yeah, basically, um, we must uh, embed all sustainability topics within our decisions we do. And um, that's pretty tough within an organization, but um, I guess this is um, the key factor to differentiate and we need to do that to reach this um, 2050 target set. Thank you. And, and Bill, I'm not sure if you've met Peter. Have you, have you met Peter Bacher before personally? I think yeah. you have. Yeah, so what's it's your been message a couple years, to, but... to Peter and, and more broadly the WBCSD members? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that I would agree with Serpil. It's, you know, we have an opportunity and a responsibility, and there is enormous power in the community that WBCSD has brought together. And in a crisis like this, it's very disruptive, but disruption poses opportunity. That a lot of things are changing. So I would say, seize that opportunity and let's fix the, all, all these major problems that we have. Thank you. And Karina, last message in a bottle from you. So I, much to Peter. I was going to steal what I thought Bill was going to say, but since he didn't say it, I'm going to repeat what I know he thinks uh, already because I agree so wholeheartedly. I think that um, CEOs in particular have a certain squeamishness around taking strong public policy positions or when they do it's to obstruct, um, but, th but they, they aren't vocal enough about driving positive change, not in the way that I would like to see them do. And, you know, there's been this phrase of the, I think the CEO activist or the CEO, or the, there are all these different phrases floating around. I, I really want to see my CEOs getting out there and not being shy about speaking about the things that Bill spoke about, about um, the fact that there are certain you know, historic societal challenges that we will not fix if we just focus on keeping our operations, you know, efficient and clean and competitive. We have to, um, we have to reach across to the political leaders and we have to fashion policies together. And we have to do it in a transparent way for otherwise we risk being, um, you know, accused of undue influence. So we have to be, you know, absolutely scrupulous about that transparency. But I think we have to, we have to just shed any, any reluctance or squeamishness we have about, about saying that business and politics don't mix because they have to if we're going to fix these problems. Great. And I think, I think we've seen many great examples of that, whether that's companies moving towards, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, making hand sanitizer or protective equipment mm -hmm. Or, or just making sure that the food banks in their local communities have food in them um, means that we, we have to do more than just look at our bottom line. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists, uh, Serpil, Marcello, Bill, and Karina. I think I, I want to thank you for your honesty um, and sharing both your, your personal and your professional reflections on what has clearly been um, an unprecedented time. Uh, for my own self, I, I've got a lot of hope out of both the stories and the conversation today, but just in general, in general how I see uh, humanity rising to the challenge. Yes, there's been leadership failures, that's clear, um, but boy, there has certainly been, um, uh, you know, heroic stories, um, often uh, by those that we had ignored uh, to some degree, or certainly had not paid well, whether those are the, the lorry drivers, uh, 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 the garbage people, the people working in the, the retail, or of course, um, nurses and doctors themselves. And we see that we can make a difference. Um, and I think that gives us a, a tremendous amount of courage that there are times when we have to put humanity ahead of economics and then change 
the economic system so that it works for humanity, uh, uh, the resilience in the future. So, so thanks very much uh, uh, to that from, from me and from WBCSD. I know Austin's got a few housekeeping things he wants to end with, but I'd just like to say thank you so much. I, I really think that was a, a, a robust discussion. Austin? Great. Yep. So thank you so much uh, to Gail and our panelists. Just before we head off, um, I want to remind everyone that you should be watching your inboxes for slides and recordings of this session in the coming day or so. And also to remind you that you can gain insights into how businesses are responding to the pandemic in concrete ways at the continuously updated COVID-19 hub on WBCSC's website. And finally, uh, remember to visit our events page to find upcoming events in this virtual series. The next few events will focus on modernizing governance this Wednesday, May 20th, creating value, mitigating risk, and tackling food system externalities next Wednesday, May 27th, and how all sectors can unite to achieve SDG 2 next Thursday, May 28th. Uh, and with that, I'd like to just say thank you for joining and wish you well as we all navigate the next stages of the pandemic. Cool. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Stay safe.